So, but thank you all for coming out during lunch today. Uh, the part of the Excellent Sustainability Speaker Series. I am very pleased to uh, have Mr. Colin Coyne with us. And notably, Colin is a 1985 Kellogg alum, so one of our own. We're pleased to have you have you join us today. He founded the Coyne Group, which is a strategy consulting firm based in Alabama, and has had significant other experience in the sustainability industry that I'm going to let him speak to. So no need for further introduction. Colin, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the beauty of having a videotape. Um, about five years ago, I was sitting in a movie theater in Birmingham, Alabama. And on my lap was my then 10-year-old daughter, Ariana. And to my left was her twin brother, Dallas. And to my right was my nine-year-old stepdaughter, Zoe. And we were watching a movie, a uh, Disney Pixar movie called Cars. Now, for those of you who have not seen Cars, Cars is, at one level, not surprisingly, a movie about cars. But at a deeper, far more profound level, Cars is a movie about a town that time forgot. Or, probably more accurately, a town that let time forget it. And it's a movie about this town's search for its character. It's a movie about how this town searches to reestablish the community fabric. And as I sat there five years ago watching this movie, I realized that I was watching a movie about the very town I was living in, Birmingham, Alabama. Or the town that I went to graduate school in, Chicago, Illinois. Or the town that I started my career in, Los Angeles, California. Or the town where I did my brief stint on Wall Street, New York. Because in each of these towns and in each of our communities, we are in a fundamental battle for that community character. We're in a fundamental battle to reestablish the community fabric. As I sit here today, five years later, I realize that I'm looking at a different community with the same problem. I'm looking at the business community. And what I see is a global crisis in business leadership. Because, make no mistake about it, the events of the last two years have fundamentally changed our community. Because the seeds that have been sown over the last 20 years have come to root. And we violated a sacred trust in the rest of the world. Now, for those of you who say, Sacred trust is a, is a mighty lofty term, Colin. I say this. I believe that business and the art of business management is a noble profession. I believe it's a profession that requires honor. honor. I believe it is a profession that will indeed lead us to environmental prosperity, to social prosperity, and to financial prosperity. To practice well. But somewhere along the line, we lost our way. And I'm pointing fingers at no one, because if you look at the fact that I graduated from Kellogg in 1985, I'm a participant in the very generation that failed. The question is, how do we find our character and how do we get it back? And I would submit to you that the way that we do that is by rethinking strategy and the way that we look at strategy at a very, very fundamental level. What I'd like to do today is talk about really three things. I want to talk about the notion of sustainability because it is, after all, not just in the title of the presentation, it is sort of the hot issue of our day. And how do we, how do we embrace these notions and tenets of sustainability but in a meaningful way? I'd then like to present to you what I believe is a new model for viewing strategy, a new way to look fundamentally at the way we approach our business decisions and try to establish a framework for re refining and redefining our character as we move forward on a global basis. And then, speaking of character, the third thing I'd like to talk about is that awful C word. The word that gets lost because we talk about it so much is character. But I want to take a slightly different view of character. I want to talk about it distinctly as part of strategic advantage. Because I want to talk about the 100 year competitive advantage that we've had in the United States that we've given away. 
So let's go back and just talk about strategy for a minute. I mean, uh, sustainability for a minute. Now, when I talk about sustainability, I, I speak, I'm very fortunate, I can speak all over the country about sustainability. And what I've found over the time is that the audience instantly sort of goes into three different buckets. Well, bucket number one are the people who get it at a deeply resonant value, uh, resonant level. That if there's something emotive about it, there's something passionate about it, and they're long on resonance. The second bucket are the people who have a vis viscerally negative response to sustainability. They see it as a politically driven agenda, an example of just the liberals taking over. And of course, you cannot talk about environmental stewardship and profit in the same sentence. There's got to be some hidden agenda. And the third bucket are the people who are just stuck on the fence, who sit here and say, I kind of have this feeling like I should be doing something right, but I just don't know how. Which bucket are you in? How many are in the first bucket? You get it at a deeply resonant level. It's something that is passionate to you, that drives you. Okay? How many of y'all are the ones who have that viscerally negative response? That this is really some sort of closet pinko communism that's really negative? <laughs> and how many of y'all follow in the third bucket? That sort of know, but don't quite know what to do with it. Okay? To the first audience, I say this. Unless and until we learn to speak the language of business to business, sustainability will remain nothing more than a motivational poster on the wall. Unless we speak to the people who control the fundamental allocation of resources in the world, sustainability will go nowhere. <coughs> to the second group, I say this. Unless and until you're serious about sustainability, you are not serious about the practice of management. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about the allocation of resources. And one of the definitions of management is the ability to efficiently allocate finite resources efficiently. So let's strip away all the verbiage. Let's strip away all the labels. Let's strip away the things that polarize the debate let's focus on the debate itself. Now, probably the best way to do that is to start out and focus in on a definition we can agree on. Most people, when they talk about sustainability, I did it for years, talked about this marriage and synthesis between environmental responsibility, social accountability, and financial profit. And it was always that Venn diagram. You know, y'all have seen this one, right? three circles that come together like this. You know, we'll, talk, we'll call it economic, social, and financial. People, planet, profit, all those things. Y'all familiar with this diagram? Some people refer to it as the virgin diagram. The problem with the diagram is that it is leading to the, fraction, to the fractionalizing of the debate. What you're seeing is this implies that environmental responsibility, social accountability, and financial opportunity are separate silos. And if we cram together long enough and really push, we can force this little nirvana in the middle called sustainability. Now, what happens when the force is applied in one direction? Basic physics, right? Push back. This is a great model for capturing three elements, but it's a horrible model for advancing the debate and the acceptance of sustainable principles. The other thing this model lacks is it doesn't call, talk about cause and effect. And the fact is, environmental irresponsibility directly and causally leads to social inequity. Social inequity directly and causally leads to financial instability. Let me give you an example. In Birmingham, Alabama, we live in Jefferson County. If you take the environmental scorecard of Jefferson County, it is among the top 10 most polluted counties in the United States. Congratulations, Cook County here in Illinois. You, too, are in the top ten. So what? Why does that matter? We can talk about the whys and the wherefores and how the industrial towns came up, but that's not what we're here to talk about. Today. So what? Why does it matter? It matters because environmental <coughs> responsibility leads to social inequity. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take that environmental scorecard and 
Birmingham, and let's overlay a social metric. People of color are 5.75 times more likely to live near a toxic air pollutant discharger than whites in Birmingham, Alabama. <clears throat> now, before you say, well, there's the South again, just can't reconcile its racist past, congratulations, Gary, Indiana. Gary, Indiana, to live near a toxic chemical discharger, 7.73 times more likely. It may be the racism, but it's economic racism, not necessarily skin color racism. But at the very least, it is a social inequity. So why does that matter? It matters because <coughs> social inequities invariably lead to financial instability. Trust me, if you try to raise capital and bring it from New York to Birmingham, Alabama, George Wallace still lives on the schoolhouse steps. South Central LA still has a stigma attached to it, Ybor City, even though it's completely rebuilt. Forget the fact that in Birmingham, Alabama, I will tell you, it's, it's my passionate belief, that the prospects for race relations in Birmingham, Alabama are better than in any major city in the United States. Because in Birmingham, we've had to talk about it. We've had to get past it. And in Boston and in Chicago, still somewhat politically incorrect to really address the issues that need to be addressed. When I talk about urban decay, when I talk about these social crises we have, we don't have to look any further than just down the road here in Chicago. There's one mother eloquently said, it's not that that boy was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He was in the right place at the right time. He was at school. 38 people killed last year in similar violence in Chicago. And we're on a race to break it. So we're not talking about regionalization in the country. We're talking about cause and effect relationships that can't be ignored. Now, the other thing I don't like about the whole discussion about sustainability, particularly in the business world, is that it implies that it's an end, when in fact it's a means. Sustainability, practiced well, is nothing more than a thought process, but it's one that we have to get at a deeply resonant level and understand so that it becomes intuitive. I was talking with uh, Dean Chopra, had lunch with him last month over at the Allen Center. And we spoke of the possibility of teaching a course here at Kellogg. And it turns out I may be back next uh, quarter or in the spring quarter to teach a course here. But what we agreed on is the course shouldn't be five years from now, sustainability anything. If we are successful at Kellogg, five years from now, there will be no sustainability courses. Because they will, in fact, be such an ingrained part of how we learn how we teach and how we embrace this new model of business leadership. <coughs> that is the goal we should be trying to get to. What I'd like to do, though, is retain the basic tenets of sustainability, because I think they're fundamentally sound, strip away the labels, which thus strips, strip away the politics. Am I a do-gooding tree hugger? Am I some liberal pansy? Or am I a capitalist scumbag pig? The answer is yes. Yes, I'm all of those things if I am a better business player. So let's take a new look at strategy. Let's, let, if, if, let's create a new model of strategy. Then. And I want to be clear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that this strategy replaces other strategies. It would be arrogant. It would be foolish. I would get laughed out of here rightfully if I, in a million years, in, in, insinuated that the Cotlers and the Stern strategies aren't there. Although I do think Phil should introduce two more P's to marketing. Um, pandering and porn. Um, <laughs> what I am trying to do is create a model by which we can contextualize the strategies that are out there. Because that's what's being lost. Is we have all these different strategies, but how do they fit into this global environment? And it's incredibly important that we address this as a global issue. As Tom Freeman said, the world is getting hot, flat, and crowded. The whole world already is hot, flat, and crowded. But how do we address this in such a way that the values that we espouse, the values that we hold, are infinitely transferable? Because here's the reality we face. Joe on Main Street competes with Sanjay in Mumbai and Chan in Hong Kong, and Juan in Rio de Janeiro. 
Oh, that's right. Sorry, Rio de Janeiro is not a good word. Chicago. Sorry. Okay. Um, but the truth is, with perfect information, margins are squeezed because we can't exploit pricing inefficiencies through knowledge inefficiencies anymore. We have to see this as a global issue. So let me then present this model to you for your consideration. But I want to do it explicitly in business terms. The model begins with what I call, or I think all strategies begin with what I call self-centric strategies. These are firm strategies that the firm is focused on mostly to the betterment of the firm. The model then grows in the, to the le second level of strategy, the strategies that I call client-centric. This is where the firm realizes it has to get outside of itself and serve the needs of its client to continue to sustain itself. Nothing particularly insightful so far. But again, in a minute I'm going to give you some examples and categorize it so you can see how this model works. The third level, and this is where the McKinsey's of the world start really making their money big time, is what I call growth strategy, growth-centric strategy. These are the strategies that say, okay, to sustain ourselves and continue to increase shareholder value, we have to continually reinvent ourselves and grow as a firm. Not so much the way that strategy is practiced here, but in my experience, the way strategy is practiced out there. This is where most strategy work begins and ends. Some people never get past the first bubble. Most stop at the third bubble. The strategy work that I find really exciting, the stuff that just at the coin group I love to do, is the fourth circle strategy. It's what I call chain-centric strategy. Chain-centric strategy is where you sit here and say, we are going to redefine the way the rules of the game are played. We're going to fundamentally shift the landscape so that only we can meet the demands. And this is where the really exciting stuff starts to happen. The problem is, if we stop right here, and we end strategy right here, we ignore the greater picture. All businesses fundamentally exist where? Within communities and within societies. And so we have to encapture, encapsulate these strategies in a larger systemic arc where we capture values and heritage and where we see where the connectors are. You cannot, you cannot divorce business from the societies in which it operates any more than you can divorce these societies from the larger environment. And yes, when I talk about the environment, I am talking about land and air and water. But I'm also talking about political environments, and human resource environments. I'm talking about the capital environment. Last night, when I had the privilege of speaking to the real estate club, we spent a lot of time talking about the evolution of the capital market, <coughs> why they collapsed, what were the underlying causes, what are the long-term implications. We have to understand that these are parts of larger holes. If you want to sort of intuitively grasp the model that I'm trying to convey here, you need to look further, no further than your bodies. Just as the heart cannot be healthy if the body withers, the body withers if the heart decays. We have to start thinking of these business strategies as one organism as a living environment. And if we do that, we get away from the siloing of mentality that says environment's over here, society's over here, and profit is over here. They're absolutely, positively indistinguishable parts of the greater whole. It is a fundamentally different way to look at business and its strategy. And so that every issue you look at, every case study you look at, every study group you go to, if we can start developing business leaders that intuitively see the living organism, we start finding greater solutions. Let me take it out of the abstract and put it into some specifics then. Give me some examples. Some examples of self-centric strategy. What I find today with a number of clients, expense cutting they see as a, as a self-centric strategy. Well, expense cutting is not even a good tactic half the time, but this is where people see, uh, see it. ATMs back in the 80s, 
When ATMs were created, it was an expense cutting strategy. It wasn't a customer service strategy. It was a strategy designed to let the customer to take care of itself so that they can have, have as large as they and have uh, tellers waiting on them. Which is why it just kills me every time they want to charge me to get my own money out of. Uh, it's kind of like double jeopardy, you know, you're having to pay for it twice. Um, ISO, the ISO programs are self centric strategies designed to make the firm better. Client centric strategies, some examples of that. Uh, do you remember the Black & Decker snake light? I, I just thought it was one of the most brilliant inv innovations. They took something and said, what was a real need that customers had using their product? The product hadn't changed for, you know, 50 years. It was the fact that, like, I always had, you know, they did these great commercials and people holding in their teeth and everything. So they created a snake light. You stand by itself, you can wrap it around the pole, you can fix the light somewhere. It was meeting a need. Distribution strategy, conventional distribution strategy, falls somewhere between self-centric and client-centric strategy. Uh, the 3G networks on cell phones are client-centric strategy because the needs were changing, the technology was changing, people need one to be able to access greater sets of information on their phone. Okay, what's some examples of um, growth strategy? Now, there's a million of them, but let's just go with these for now. The CMBS market, I didn't say all these were good examples. The banks figured out that to grow and to pump more loans to their system, they had to create liquidity, so they securitized the loans, moved them off the books, and they were able to continue grow. Unfortunately, they tend to grow in fee generation more than they generate grew in value generation, but that's, that was last night's discussion. Broadband. The cable companies realized for them to grow and accept new things, they had to start being able to offer, if they, if they widen the bandwidth, they could offer more goods and services through it. Franchise systems, obvious growth strategies there. Let's move into the fun stuff. Let's get to, to, to change-centric strategies. I love change-centric strategies. Some examples there would be the advent of the first <coughs> computer. Google, I think Google's phenomenal. Google fundamentally changed the way we access information. So much so that they, it, to me, the, the ultimate in business is when you become a verb. So, you know, Google. And whether you like the guy, don't like the guy, voted for him or didn't vote for him, the Obama campaign fundamentally changed the landscape of which all future elections will be run. And if you vote, if you argue that his widget were votes. He sold a lot of widgets. How did he do that? His victory wasn't beating the Cain Palin. His victory was beating the Clinton machine within the Democratic Party. So what he did is he went all the way around the machine and went straight to the, the vote, straight to the individual. The most intelligent use of technology <coughs> I've seen in the public uh, you know, sector in a long, long time. But he changed the rules of the game so that only he could win traditional first mover advantage. So those are examples of the strategy. Let's move to the next level. Let's look at um, uh, the societal arts. What are some examples there? Okay. Let's say I'm developing a hotel. I worked on a project where we're developing a four-star hotel. And we decided that all the towels and the sheets and the pillowcases, when they were no longer four-star quality, but were still in remarkably good shape, we would give to the local homeless shelters, the firehouse shelter, the only shelter that allowed indigent men with children to stay in it, the Pathways Battery Women's Shelter. Is that social do-getting? Maybe. But what if I told you it reduced vacancy, which reduced vandalism, which reduced my security costs? What if I told you it, it drove revenues because it enhanced the guest experience is that social do-getting, or is that an economically driven model? There's an apartment developer in Los Angeles who figured out one day, he went in and bought 50% occupied property in um, um, <coughs> South Central LA. And what they did is they sat there and they looked at what the real social needs of the community were. And so what they decided to do was take two apartments offline and give them to teachers. And in return, all these teachers had to do was agreed to tutor for one hour night. Was, was to tutor for one hour night each. Occupancy went to 100%. Strange other thing happened. They're starting to develop this community pride so to the point where his maintenance crews were being run off by the, the, the elderly ladies who said, no, we take care of the gardens here now. And they're now starting to replicate this model in other parts of the United States. Social do-gooding? or a heck of an increase in value in 
the value of that property. McQueen Pipe and Steel, in, uh, uh, from McQueen Pipe in Birmingham. Robert Page, the president, called me over one day and said, Colin, I want to talk to you about this issue I have. And you're like this green guy, right? <laughs> okay, I've been called worse um, by my kids in the last 24 hours sometime. But um, he said, the PVC manufacturers are killing us with this whole notion that they're greener than ductile iron pipe. That's not true. I want you to tell me how we can attack the PVC makers. And so we're up there, we can do that. What if I told you that there's a way to reduce your problems with DOJ, reduce your problems with EPA, get the unions off your back. Then you started listening. I started talking to things that mattered to him. Yes, we were going to fix some of the environmental problems, and now McQueen is winning awards in ductile iron pipe production. It's winning green awards. They're down to one issue with the Department of Justice when they had, I think, it was six at the time. Is a fundamentally different way if you embrace the values of the community in such a way. Final example I would offer is the new home that we're talking about, that's being talked about for the Kellogg School. It's my belief that a building is the physical embodiment of the values society holds. And if that is the case, what should this new building look like? What makes Kellogg special? Community. The gathering of the students. That's what all the employers say when you get out. Thought leadership. I mean, have you ever really looked around the room at each other and realized that at this moment, it's quite possible that nowhere else in the United States is there so much capacity for change in any one room than right here? Because you are the future leaders. You are the ones who are going to shape the world. Shouldn't the new building embody that? Shouldn't it embody thought leadership? Shouldn't the new building be the first regenerative building in the world? Where it produces more than it actually uses? By the way, Sally, I think that will help the capital campaign a bunch. Strategy needs be viewed as this living organism. And organisms exist from the greater body, and that's of society. But it also exists in the larger environment, the physical environment and the capital environments. When Coca-Cola wakes up one day and says, we're the largest user of natural water resources on the planet, and they say, we're going to team up with the World Wildlife Fund to protect the rivers and the streams, is that environmental duty? Do goodism, if there's such a word. Sound like George Bush. Strategic. <laughs> uh, um, or is it protecting their supply chain? My point is, it doesn't matter because they're indistinguishable parts of the whole. Now, I was wrestling with this model, and on Friday at about 4 o'clock, um, I'm working on a project to support sort of this new cutting edge library that hopefully when we're done will be the nation's premier example of form and function together. It's going to be lead, gold, and the programming is all cool inside. But I'm working with this architecture firm uh, called HKW, and that's a great bunch of guys. And I realized for this presentation that this model is okay, but it's two-dimensional. I went to him about 4 o'clock on Friday and said, hey guys, I've got this opportunity to speak with some of the elite business minds of the future. And I need your help. To get this model right, it really should be three-dimensional. It really should be this really convey this notion of organism and organism. And so last night at about midnight, they emailed me a file with an animation of what this model should look like in three dimensions. So my, my, my point on this is think of it as your body, and you start to see things a little bit different. The idea is simply this, that um, if we can see the, the strategy model in three dimensions, we get a better idea of how there's one living organism can't separate it. And again, let me go back to your bodies for instance, the example. We all know that our bodies don't function as well when we're under stress, right? A lot of stress comes from values conflict. So that second arc of, value, arc of values, it means the heart's not performing as well. It'll lead to heart disease, or rheumatoid arthritis, or that sort of thing. 
all the talk of H1N1, that's out in the larger environment. We know to avoid the things that are unhealthy because we know if the larger environment is impacted and we don't take care of it, it will in fact, in fact affect our health and again, can damage the heart. <coughs> this is the, base, the basic notion of this model. We have to start seeing these tr strategies as part of the larger whole. And if we do, it leads to fundamentally different solutions from the ground up. But if we're going to look at this issue of strategy, there's one more issue of strategy I think we need to consider as well. And that's this issue of character. Because we're in a new world where more than ever before, values matter more. Than ever before, values matter more. And I think they matter more to those of you in this room, to those of us on Wall Street, to those of us in the American business system. Because in the last two years, we gave away the strategic advantage we had held for 100. The Bernie Madoffs of the world destroyed 100 years of competitive advantage. And the competitive advantage I'm speaking of is that of assumed preeminence. What do I mean by that? By virtue of the fact that you are part of the American business model, the most successful capitalist society, more value creation than any other system in history. There was a certain assumption that when you walked into the room, no matter where you were in the world, that you probably knew a little bit about what you were talking about. And if you were from Wall Street, you probably knew a lot. Assume preeminence. It's also a concept that I work with on some of my clients. There's I have one particular contracting client who walks in the door and their mere presence in the room, they get a huge share of the business because in, in open bid situations because people just assume that they know more. The fact is, that competitive advantage has gone away. We are no longer going to be assumed to be preeminent. In fact, for some, there will be that stigma that is carried with them, especially as we start to reinvent new liquidity vehicles for investments, like in real estate, the CMBS 2.0. There's going to be a certain skepticism. But it's not all the gloom and doom. The fact is, there is no one else more qualified to assume <laughs> the preeminent position than America to recapture that. And in particular, in my opinion, the Kellogg student. Yes, I'm a proud alum. But the fact is, you are richly blessed to attend the Kellogg School of Management. Yes, Kellogg stimulates your mind and your intellect, like the other major business schools. Yes, it expands your horizons, like the other business schools. But there's one thing that's unique to Kellogg that positions it better for the global economy and the today's stress than any other. And that is that Kellogg demands that you showcase your character. It demands that you hone your character by working together, by even having things such as social responsibility or seek or that sort of thing as part of the structure of the, of the school. You are better positioned because you are already, by the way you live here, being trained for the demands of the real world that's out there. If we are willing to sincerely demonstrate our character, I do believe that we will regain the trust that we lost when we violated that sacred covenant. I do believe that our position of assumed preeminence can return, and that's a remarkable strategic competitive advantage. To me, the goal of global prosperity is to accept and embrace this notion that we are part of the greater whole. To quit siloizing, if there's such a word, putting in silos, this notion of environmental stewardship and social responsibility and financial profit. It's a fundamentally new model, to, a new way to look at strategy. And it goes well past just idle words. I do believe that it is the solution that will sustain us and allow for prosperity, not just to business, but equitable prosperity. And that is the issue of equity that's going to become more and more and more important as the world becomes more and more and more crowded. I'd like to offer some closing thoughts and take it away from the big and the lofty and the strategic. In 1968, I was a six-year-old boy living in Australia, and on, and on February 1st of that year, I went, I went to bed a fundamentally different human being than the one that woke up. I went to
went to bed a different human being because during the course of the day, I found my sister, Kathy, drowned in our swimming pool. We went, we got her out. My mom gave her mouth to mouth. And we took her to the hospital. By all accounts, she, she fought back. But it was her time and God called her. 23 years later, I was sitting here, Kellogg School of Management. And on April 11, 1985, again, my world was rocked. Because my best friend in the entire world died. Nobody's told me to this day that my mother died. I was in Kennedy Airport, about to board a plane to Jamaica, and I saw the expression on my brother Kevin's face. Fast forward about another 23 years. January 27, 2003, I got home, I opened the door, and my furniture was gone. My wife was gone. Dallas and Ariana were gone. For reasons better explained by my now ex-wife, she had found distractions and other things and thought, maybe she needed to go there. Now I stand here today, remarried to the absolute love of my life, the one you look for from the time you're 12 years old. I'm the sole custodian of Dallas and Ariana, and I have a new daughter in Zoe. Life's funny, it works out that way. What do these personal stories have to do with the future business elite sitting at Kellogg School of Management in Evanston, Illinois? It turns out a lot, because there are three lessons that I learned through these life experiences. First, everything that you care about and hold dear can be gone in an instant. <coughs> Second, there's not time for anger and bitterness and blame. There's only time to feel, to think, and to act. And third, in those rare opportunities, when you get the chance to get back that which was dear, that which you lost, you fight, fight like hell to get it back. Our noble profession of business management was taken away <clears throat> in many ways. Our character was stripped of us in the last two years. Like that. Seen. We have to get past the anger and the blame and the bitterness. And we need to feel and we need to think and we need to do. We need to make the changes to recapture the character. And it is indeed time to fight like hell to get it back. A very good friend named Bob Bergwald helped found the U.S. Green Building Council. And at the close of his presentations, he always puts up a slide, this really cool slide of all these kids just goofing off. And he tells the, the audience that these are the children with perfect vision. And he tells them that because these are kids who will graduate in the year 2020. I have two questions for you I'd like to close with. On January 1st, and I want you to think about this in your study groups. I want you to think about this this weekend. This is the question I really want you to think about in your remaining time at Kellogg as you go beyond. On January 1st, 2020, when these children with perfect vision wake up, <coughs> what is the world you want them to see? Because it's you who will make that world. You are the ones will be the architect of their future. The world is watching. The world is waiting. The world is wanting. The world is willing. My last question to you is this. What are you going Thank you for the privilege of sharing your mind.
necessarily run out here other than to make sure my car hasn't been towed from the parking lot. client that's a large general contractor, one of the largest in the country. And um, um, we're talking about, and a lot of clients are coming to me because they're saying, okay, we've got this range of what we're supposed to do. Um, and um, if you look at what's happening in the capital markets right now, the future for construction looks, shall I say, very different than it did two years ago. And so I'm working with them on sort of recreating themselves to match this new world. And in the meeting, one of the meetings I had with them, um, CEO, I looked over at Jim and I said, Jim, what's the average divorce rate among your project superintendents? And he looked at me with this, not only do I not know, but why on earth do I need to know? Look on his face. And I said, because if you don't know what that is, you don't know whether or not your project superintendents are paying attention to the job. If your project superintendent is thinking about his wife taking the kids, taking his money, and running off the milk pan, he's not thinking about that job. Why does that matter? Well, because it turns out this contractor's at the forefront of, of lead certified construction. Buildings are being leased. Buildings are being um, represented to be lead certified. That project superintendent blows it and allows something to get on the site or something gets messed up, and that building loses its lead certification or doesn't achieve it, there's a huge liability issue for that contractor. So again, we're talking about divorce rates or turnover rates, that sort of thing. Are we talking about social do-getting? Are we talking about the direct bottom line because it's a risk management issue? So that's one example of <coughs> a broader picture that, that, you know, that we then try to ferret through. So then the issue is how do you create a sustainable strategy for the firm that allows them to embrace these multiple notions? Okay, another example that I work with them on. I believe that fundamentally we have to start building these buildings for 25% less than the cost that we're building for today. The exact same buildings for 25% less. How are we going to do that? We have to look at the way distribution systems work. We have to look at the way the manufacturing process and design process works. We have to look at the way that we're using uh, finite resources. We have to look at a better, more creative way to reuse those resources. Um, I have another client that is um, a large industry trade association. And what they're finding is it's very difficult for them to get the nationwide, um, uh, their constituents to sort of understand this, this complexity of what green, const uh, green um, construction technique is. So how do we break that down? But break it down in a way that allows them to see that it's not diametrically opposed. Uh, I do a lot of economic development work. I speak to lots of mayors and that sort of thing. Um, and getting them to understand that if you don't understand uh, the economic development potential of, of, of green, you're missing a bigger picture. What are some examples of that? Um, I think there's a way to save the Birmingham City School System or any school system by moving to public endowed, uh, or, or endowed public school systems. Uh, and there's a specific model that we're working with them to embrace. Um, I think there's an opportunity in certain areas of the country to regenerate economies from um, taking advantage of the lower cost labor pool um, to, to take away the, the price differ differential in organic farming, because that's the fastest growing area of the supermarket right now. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples of work we're doing right now. Um, law firm, client, we have a uh, law firm as a client, just looking how to position itself uh, in the insurance industry, doing some work with the insurance industry, by the way, who I think will have uh, probably the greatest impact on the built environment of any other group, um, you know, how they decided they were going to um, ensure health care first change the face of health care. They start saying, we're going to ensure this building, but not that type of building, or that this cost versus that, will do more systemic sweep of change. But the biggest issue that's consistent across all of them is trying to stop everybody's knee-jerk reaction to green. I'll sit here and tell you unequivocally that if it's not increasing your profits, increasing your market share, or at the very least allowing you to live closer to the values you hold as a firm, you shouldn't be doing it. Not necessarily because it's the wrong thing, but you're probably doing it wrong.
feeling a personal pain threshold. Um, if, if I can get um, if I can get Southern Company to change just a little bit of how they go about their business, I can probably do more for the environment than building a hundred lead buildings. it's a lot more difficult to get them to move. And what I'm finding with my clients is there is beauty in sort of this grassroots, even a southern company who's not a client, by the way, I uh, just do a lot of you know, work alongside them. There's this grassroots movement that's coming up and percolating from the people that decided to join and not surrender their personal values and their personal um, uh, goals. Uh, I think uh, we have a horrible challenge as we go out to these large organizations of maintaining our sense of self, our personal um, values and not letting them be necessarily um, hijacked by the larger organization. But at the same time, those organizations are highly, highly, highly relevant. The smaller organizations, the ones that are deep in passion and are highly resonant, it takes both to make it work. So it's really an issue of personal pain. So where do you choose? My particular career path, my God, I live in Birmingham, Alabama. You know, it's, let's just say I'm swimming against the tide a lot on a lot of issues. But I moved to Birmingham by choice at the time I was doing consulting work in 17 different countries. I could have moved anywhere I wanted. I chose Birmingham because I thought there was a place where my personal work could make a difference versus one more voice in New York City. Um, we talked about this a little bit last night. I think it's also an issue of personal threat, you know, pain in the wallet. I clearly would have made more money moving to New York in my career, without a doubt. But I can't help but thinking for me personally, my personal life decision. Uh, that I would have lost a little sense of my soul. The truth is, you guys can make as much money as you need to make to survive and then some. That's not the issue. I think one of the things we don't spend enough time is really saying, what do we want to do versus what do we think we have to do? And the truth is, especially as it's becoming a flatter world, you have the ability to marry wants and needs far better than you ever had before. So, again, I applaud anybody who sticks to their values, who sticks to their cultures. Uh, and, uh, but I also especially applaud the people who learn to go to other people's cultures and look at a different value system and not try to thrust their value system on others. And I think that's actually a long-term problem of the typical American business. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about the model, and specifically, what do you think of a good example? Um, once people argue that like Coke's motivation for wanting to improve water quality or whatever that example was, would it, would it matter what they were driven by? Branding and whether it was driven by finance or whether it was actually driven by the, the goodness of their heart wanting to be sustainable. Is it I offer that because um, y'all know who Ray Anderson is. Ray Anderson founded Interface Park Carpets. He is somewhat viewed as the industrialist guru of the sustainability market movement because he took a heavy petrochemical driven business and said by 2020 we will be carbon neutral. And he is well on his way to getting there. Here's the amazing thing. Billion dollar a year company, publicly traded, and Ray did this 15 years ago, and he stayed as chairman of the board. He never got ousted, and the profits have only gone up. I was in a meeting with Ray one time, and this issue came up over whether we should build the world's first sustainable McDonald's, the lead certified sort of McDonald's. And we had a shareholder who was adamantly opposed to doing it because they're responsible for fighting more American children than anywhere else. And yes, it, believe me, childhood obesity is, is an epidemic. Our children are expected to live, have a, for the first time ever, expect to have a shorter lifespan than we are. And if you talk about fixing health care, fix childhood obesity. You can go a long way. So it's a very real and heated argument. And one of the, the shareholders was making the argument that they're not motivated by anything to save the environment. They're motivated by simply trying to save operating costs. And Ray actually spoke quite eloquently. Say, who am I to question another's motivation? And who am I to question what gets them to the table to see it a different way? If at the end of the day, it leads to positive social stewardship or environmental stewardship, who are we to question? The point of my model, the central point of my model is they are indistinguishable parts of the greater whole. So literally, if you are addressing one, you should be addressing others. If you are the most profit-seeking SOB in the world, 
you should care deeply about the environment and the allocation of those resources efficiently. Because if you don't take care of them, what is going to happen to the price of your natural, uh, of your raw input? It's only going to go up. But what we're finding, McCoy Pipe, they went out and sort of as a throwaway item to keep EPA happy, they did this series of environmental improvements at their factories and really had to ram it down two of the manager's throats. They literally got, within one year, a 300% return on their investment. And that's a return into perpetuity. Every other plant manager is lining up saying, we want to do those environmental things here. Was it to save the environment? No. But the truth is, by taking care of the environment, it reduced their overall cost structure. So again, my point is, let's quit labeling and siloing. Let's sit here and say, it's one and the same. We can't distinguish it. No, fine. I can give you heart medication or I can take the heart out of your body and try to work on it over here. Which would you rather me do? Keep it as the one organism and make it indistinguishable. Again, y'all have been extremely generous with your time. And your two greatest assets, your greatest asset is your mind, your most precious resource is your time and you share both with me today. And 25, it would take 25 years before you understand what this means. Um, but it really, really is an amazing privilege to stand here speaking to you. So thank you.